Once upon a time on Prompted, the Prompted gang all write horror stories of a slightly different flavour. We hope you enjoy this scary, scary episode. We are doing a very horror-themed week this week, which is quite exciting. I don't know if it was intentional, but that has been it's, what happened. As, as Bob Ross would say, it's a happy accident. It is a happy accident. <laughs> or a we horrific. We do love Bob Ross. Mm-hmm. Oh, it, right, okay. On that note. <laughs> All right, so the prompt this week was an interesting one. And it was, you married into the Japanese spaghetti, I was born into it. This prompt actually came from my housemate again, because who else would it come from? We're all locked in our houses. Um, my housemate was talking about a recipe, a, a age-old recipe in their family, and essentially it was a recipe given to them by a Japanese woman, so that's why they called it Japanese spaghetti. However... Uh, my housemate's stepdad is Italian, which meant that this Italian man was very horrified by the Japanese spaghetti, which was uh, spaghetti, some leftover vegetables, and ketchup. Ew! No! No! no. no. I hate that. So he, he attacked the Japanese spaghetti recipe, and everyone attacked back because even though they all also hate it, it was it's like a it's like a thing of pride so yeah that's where the you married into the japanese spaghetti i was born into it was a came from so you can't you can't diss the japanese spaghetti because you married into this this is what you chose (laughs) my boyfriend puts will have like a pasta dish and he puts ketchup over the top of it only if it's a day old but like ketchup I, so i'll make him a carbonara and he just Ooh. says can i have the ketchup and i say no because that's disgusting that's disgusting but he always wins and he's just squirts it over it's mm, oh it, that that's is horrible that is the horror so that's yeah that's the main that's why this week is a horror <laughs> theme we're all horrified at ketchup we're all mm-hmm. horrified at ketchup spaghetti uh who who is going first? Uh, I believe it is me this week. Yeah. Erin, yay! Erin, mm. tell us about your peas. Uh, I'm actually not going to, because I want you to, to do some figuring out as you're reading. Fair so. enough, but how, how did you find writing it this week? Um, I got very stuck and wrote it in a rush, but it was a good rush because something came out of it. The joys of writing. Valid. <laughs> valid. Very valid. Okay. Right. Do you guys do you guys both know who you're playing? Yeah. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. They came when the moon was high. A young couple, two women. The first one over the threshold was eager, curious. She walked loudly with muddy boots across the tiles that my mother had selected long ago. Come on. She urged. We might find something cool. I frowned at that. The house wasn't cold. I watched her from the top of the stairs, hidden in the shadows. The other followed, hesitating in the doorway before loyalty drove her forward. She blinked in the dark like a confused animal. Is it legal? She asked. Of course it's legal. It's still technically mine. You're marrying into my family's weirdness, and that includes a share in inheriting all the stuff Great Uncle Alf bought. As she stepped into a patch of moonlight, shining through the glass pattern on the door, I saw her face grinning wildly. I didn't recognise her. I ducked back into my bedroom as they came upstairs. There were cobwebs strung between my bedpost. I brushed through them and huddled on the bed. Maybe they would just take something cheap, like the vase at the end of the hall, or the kitchen crockery. If they found things of value, they would leave me alone. The door handle rattled. Locked. The first one said. What do you reckon's in there? She put her shoulder into the door hard. 
I jumped off the bed and rolled under it, pulling my knees up to my chin and gripping them tight. The dust was thick, so much that my heavy breathing didn't move it. Probably nothing. I heard the other scrape her shoes on the carpet. It was already going threadbare. She was making it worse. Can we turn the lights on? I heard her run her hands along the wall, searching for a switch. Her fingertips would leave smudges of grease along the wallpaper, the flowery one we had imported. They would taint the house, leave their stains and echoes within its walls, and I would never be at peace. People kept coming into my house, breaking the locks the council kept replacing, spraying colours across the walls, spilling alcohol across the floorboards that I kept so clean. This needed to stop. I crawled out from under the bed, tilted my head and watched the lock click. The door swung open and I saw them, so bold where they weren't welcome. They peered into my room. It took them a moment before they saw me in the dark. Another second before they noticed the bloody wound in the centre of my chest, the blood that stuck the fabric of the dress to my skin. One screamed. I put an end to that quickly. The other ran, tearing down the rugs, scuffing the polished stairs. I caught her at the door, just as she reached for the crisp night air. This had been my home for 300 years, and I would protect it. Damn. I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when it switched to I, I was like, my mouth just opened, and I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> it's not gone well. I was I was trying to drop in clues so like she doesn't know what the word cool means because she doesn't know modern slang, and she goes into her bedroom but the bedroom door is already locked. So how did yeah. she get in? Also, the dust True. not moving on the floor because yeah. it was too thick. I was like, nah, <laughs> nah, it's because you're not breathing. Because <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's why, and I, I like yeah, I see, I can see it now because that's why that they're called the first one and the second one because it's just people coming into her house. Did you, when you wrote mm. this, did you think about... Because it seemed like when you read it out, you'd really thought about the pacing and the rhythm of the words. It almost... Some bits almost seemed a little bit like poetry, I want to say. Did you think uh, about that, I, or did you just read it really well? <laughs> not intentionally, no. Um, the sentences were all quite short, because that was how she spoke, and that probably made it sound a little bit stilted, maybe. Mm. I, just, I really yeah. liked it. Yeah. Thanks, Bella. You're good at writing I, I, I now, I now have to say thank you when you guys say nice things about my writing, because you told me that I make cat noises when you compliment me, which is usually like a, <laughs> nah! and I, I, I resent this out of hand. Oh, last week's episode, there were so many moments that just lent you guys to a roasting in that Erin, when she's complimented, goes, Mrr! Bella, when she's complimented, goes, no, <laughs> you're wrong, let's move on. And then Alex, when he's complimented, goes, yeah, you're right, I'm great. <laughs> That's why my fans adore me. <laughs> Is my name on our Facebook chat still Woo from the time that a piece no, I... finished and there was a really long lag and I just went, Woo! It was like a, <laughs> trying to fill the gap and you guys just thought it was hilarious. No, it's uh, Alien Cyber Angel. Oh, I love that. That's so much better. I think. But we might change it to meow. Oh, please don't change it to cat sound. <laughs> speaking, speaking of cats and people that have cats, Izzy. Yes. <laughs> so for Horror Week, I've written about the biggest horror, which is, of course, the patriarchy. <laughs> As we know. <laughs> Obviously. I actually have a sticker on my laptop that's got a picture of Medusa on it and it says Petrify the Patriarchy and it's one of my favourite stickers. Oh, I love that. Yeah, so I have basically written about the patriarchy. I've not really stuck to the prompt as much as I should have. I just got the idea in my head and I wanted to use it. Um, this is also... The reason why this idea is in my head is because my dissertation is on a slightly similar theme and so a lot of the research that I've been doing for my dissertation I put into this piece um I don't uh, the annoying thing is I love I'm so excited about my dissertation but because it's worth so much of my degree I can't really share it unprompted because in case plagiarism laws go weird but um but yeah basically I'm just really excited to share all this research and stuff um, a little trigger warning for this one, it deals with issues of sexism and racism, and I've called it Matilda.
Who picks up the pen that writes history? Who started the mystery of the half-forgotten arrays in a blaze of white smoke to choke her until her mind resigns to live without a name? Defamed, successes blamed on the men around her. Books found her a scribe for his erudite, so he's cited. She's short-sighted. Despite her fight to marry mind and name, it's in vain. He already has the patriarchal patents complacent in the deals the steals of her inventions. It's the convention. It's how the game is played. His name displayed. His story reigns. History feigns. Her story in flames. Her work that Ashtar and Mains. Two can play that game. Who are they? Did Ada need Babbage or was she the full package? Programming machines on the horizon's mist that didn't yet exist, predicting Spotify playlists? She's listed as the thief of Babbage's glory in the 1840s. Ignore these smears. Her ideas saw their war end two years before it would have. Who are they? Percy penned the preface of Frankenstein. It bore his sign. He wore authorship, was worshipped for her successes. Authors don't run around wearing pretty dresses. Forced guesses throughout their lifetime. It was Mary who wrote the sci-fi. Who are they? Was Lamar just a wife or the mother of Wi-Fi? The star of the screen, unseen by science, asked the Alliance to patent her invention. That was the intention, until they took it for themselves. Who are they? Watson and Crick were quick to snap up Franklin's photos. Double Helix DNA didn't bother to pay her credit, even though she said it first. Accepting her Nobel Prize under the guise that men realise the discovery hypnotised the world to prioritise their names over hers. Who are they? Anning's fossils, the foundation of Darwin's evolution, she was excluded from every institution despite them needing her consultation. She said in frustration, the world has used me so unkindly. Remind me, why was she shut out when she shaped paleontology? Who are they? Let's get the ball rolling and see Alice move from Seattle to Hawaii at university, studying chemistry and then pharmacy at 23, finds a cure to leprosy, died because of chlorine, survived by Arthur Dean who swapped his name for hers. How many geniuses are hidden in the white fog? How many black women overwritten in the epilogue? Who are they? If men want to fly high, Dorothy could get them higher. But she was denied the role of supervisor. NASA had her lead without a title. But the computer computed she was entitled, worked by day, co worked by day, coded by night. Machines took her job away, but she was too bright. She saw a future in Fortran, trained the other women, and won. Who are they? If they can split the atom, why can't they split the credit? Or are the repercussions too explosive? If fission was her vision, might have left off the paper, but might nearly and put on the table a periodic period to punctuate her story, liberate history from the ties of his stories. Lift these women up from the ashes, frazzled puzzle pieces put together for the masses. Show girls how much of the world women built, tilt tainted history back into equality, stand in solidarity with the women who shaped science, technology, engineering, and maths. That was very cool. I just, your performance poetry has just the right amount of like words that are similar and enough to make them slightly tongue twisters, but not quite. It's, it's, it sounds very cool when you read it out. It thanks. Very cool. uh, I was going to say you should record it for YouTube. Oh, thanks. I'll like, try it. As a separate piece. We're already yeah. on YouTube. <laughs> no, no, I mean like as a short like, video film of you. Yeah. I also feel just very uneducated now. I, I know who a few of these women are. Don't know who all of them are. That's the problem, well, but everyone knows who Watson and Crick are, even though they took Franklin's um, photos. Yeah, I, I knew about that, and I knew about a couple others, but I have been educated on the rest, which is always a nice thing. Wonderful. The problem is it's so hard to find a lot of the women. These are just the tip of the iceberg, and most of the women that you can find are white women. Black women don't even have the credit now. So... <laughs> It's yeah, it's really interesting looking into the woman who've sort of been overwritten and had their discoveries claimed. I I see why this is your dissertation. It is a very big topic that you can <laughs> do a lot of deep digging into. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's called the Matilda effect in science, which is why I named it Matilda, where basically oh. if there are women who contribute to the discovery or they make the discovery or invent something, then it's usually a man's name who gets put on it. Okay. So messed up. Mm. <laughs> wait, 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 there's a segue here. Speaking of things that are messed up, the world in Bella's piece is messed up. 
is it is definitely messed up. It's got um, lynch things in it. Yes, we have a return of the swamp dystopia, but there aren't leeches in this section of it. Though oh. they are still there, lingering you... in the in the background. Are they? Are they? Because they're in, they're in a shop. Can you can you reassure me that there is in fact a leech that's just wiggling along outside the shop, doing Wiggle. its leech there business? Be, <laughs> there must be a little leech wiggling along outside the shop. In fact, perhaps it's the leech that gets Marnie as she walks oh, out. Oh, wonderful. We never know. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. I don't even like caterpillars. I don't know what I'd do if I saw a leech. What's wrong with caterpillars? The way that they move, they just sort of wiggle ominously. And it's... Ominously? They wiggle wiggle ominously. ominously. If you're wiggling, it's not ominously. Like maggots. Like the way maggots move. And like worms and caterpillars. That, That really kind of weird... You guys can't see this, but I'm trying to imitate it. Can you guys tell I've had coffee today? Erin is wiggling on the screen for us. Erin is wiggling away. I've had so much coffee, do you think the, do you think the listeners will notice? I mean, now that you've said it. They'll definitely notice now. Oh, dear. Right. So let's wiggle into so, Bella's piece. Wiggle into <laughs> Of the... There's been a lot of wiggling today. When we started, Erin was like, right, we need to get a wiggle on. Erin's clearly <laughs> got caterpillars on the mind. We we've, we've got a shorter time to record this week. We have to. We do have to get a wiggle on. <laughs> okay. Well, let's wiggle into, in, back into the salt <laughs> dystopia then. Just a quick content warning for violence and body horror in this piece. Please be wary when listening. Okay, here we go. Oh, gosh. Florida, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, all crawling with swamp. Junimo had taken it upon himself to mark it all out in orange highlighter. With every warble of the radio, his map of America became more and more neon, like a chemical hazard warning. Harmful, corrosive, toxic. He wiped his watery nose on his forearm and began to dot out the pockets of bog in Georgia, the crescents of quag in Texas. Mercury, who had been changing out of their wet clothes in the bedroom, flew through the kitchenette. Their hair was still wet and soaking the back of their shirt a deeper peach. They came to stand over Nin, who was listening to the Beastie Boys at an obnoxious volume with her boots on the table. Why is there old gum underneath your dresser drawer? They asked. Nin blinked at them and plucked her headset from about her ears. Eh? Mercury threw a sock onto the poly table and crossed their arms. Your gum is stuck to my sock. What? She picked up the offending garment and stared at the strings of green gunk on its heel. Did you get Tolan in my stash? Why the hell have you got a stash of used gum in the dresser? Junimo leaned back against his map and clicked the lid of his pen. Yeah, Nin. Why do you got a stash of spit? Disgusting. Marnie shrilled from the sofa and then returned to her crochet as if she hadn't spoken at all. Look, Nin said, uncrossing her legs. I only got one pack left, right? Mercury pinched the bridge of their nose. Nin, there is plenty of gum left in the stores. Yeah, but not the green apple stuff. She took a small plastic case from her pocket and held it out for Mercury to see. It's even the bubble tape kind. Six whole feet of solid gold. Nin, it's trash. Reusable trash, she quipped, pocketing the gum. Just keep your panties away from it and we've got no problems. Mercury huffed, picking their sock back up and marching back to the bedroom. The door rattled as it slammed shut. Who's on dinner duty? Nin asked Junimo, picking at a scab on her knee. He pointed at Marnie, who gave a slanted smile that pushed her cheeks up past her eyes. I'm going to make Japanese spaghetti she said. Oh, damn it! Don't worry, said Marnie, sticking a loop of wool into her mouth and sucking on it. Mercury's taking me shopping tomorrow. It was the peak of summer. The patriots had begun to lay their clammy, swollen bodies on the rooftops, stewing in their own soup. The mirage warped the reeds in forest slop, turning the bayou into a hazy land of clag. Even the gators seemed to have stopped stirring up silt in favour of resting their bellies on the cool swamp bed. Mercury and Marnie took the lull in activity as an opportunity to scavenge. 
Marnie looked uncomfortable in her tall, red rubber boots. She didn't believe in shoes. But the swamp crawlers made going barefoot impractical. Just the feel of flesh drove them wild. They kept hold of each other as they picked their way across the marsh, trying their best to stick to the shallows. But the heat was maddening, and it wasn't long before the water had slipped its way up the denim of Mercury's jeans, the mud staining the hem of Marnie's pink nightdress. They didn't encounter any gators, nor were they swarmed by fat swamp rats. Mercury kept the safety off their P-92 anyway. The patriots these days could be just as deadly as the mutant beasts of the bayou. The store they'd hiked to wasn't large, but it was in a less crowded area of the neighbourhood, and therefore more likely to still be half-stopped. It was an old 7-Eleven, though the sign had long since faded to lichen. But its foundations were just tall enough to elude the water, leaving the shop floors dry and free of swamp fauna. Mostly. When they arrived, the door was open. It had once been automatic, but Louisiana's kill switch had long since flipped. Mercury peered down the main aisle, keeping Marnie firmly behind them. The place was empty but for one man, who stood quietly behind the counter, eyeing up the last few packs of cigarettes. None for you, Marnie whispered, and then they crept forwards. Mercury headed straight for the beans. They were good protein, and rarely contaminated. They ripped open their knapsack and began piling them in, spinning each can once or twice to check for dents or holes. There was a good variety. Black beans, cannellini, kidney, garbanzo. Today was a good day. Marnie met them in aisle four, holding three bags of rice and a jar of lemon curd. I found tomato soup and creamed corn, she said. Do you have room for these? They managed two more cans of cut yams and a Comstock cherry pie filling before their zips were splitting. Nin would be upset at the lack of jalapenos, but those were a luxury anyway. She would have to be content with her recycled green apple gum. They had nearly made it back to the door when Marnie tugged on Mercury's sleeve. Still standing there, motionless as ever, was the man by the cigarettes. Mercury closed their eyes. Sweat had begun to run in thick globs down their head, and their damp bootlegs were beginning to itch, but there was never any arguing with Marnie. They tried, nevertheless. Can we let it be? They said. I'm tired. What if he's lost? She countered. Or confused? You're lost and confused, muttered Mercury. Marnie frowned, bunching one of her hands in her dress. There was a smear of dirt on her nose, a dark cirrus blasted across her face. There wasn't much Marnie did anymore. She'd lost her wits to the flood a while ago and spent most of her time writing disjointed limericks and knitting socks, but she was one of the only people left in Louisiana with a soul, and Mercury couldn't deny her. Excuse me? They called back to the counter. Sir? You all right? Nothing. Marnie hobbled over in her muddy red galoshes, arm outstretched. Hello, she said. Hello, hello. The man twitched but didn't turn. Mercury followed closely behind Marnie, nervously fingering their gun. They didn't like this. They didn't like this at all. Marnie reached the counter and began knocking on the wood. Mercury winced every time her fist came in contact. It was loud and obtrusive. Marnie was asking for a smack about the head and would likely get worse but she kept on knocking. Hello, hello, she said again. This time, the man bent his neck and shuddered. Hello, he croaked, and then again, Hello. What are you doing? Mercury asked, perhaps harsher than they meant to. Do you need help? There was a moment of silence within which Mercury's stomach began to curdle with dread. Then he moved. As he turned, the awful sound of his skin sticking and tearing roared through the mini-mart. His left arm was black, necrotic, and his face had begun to blister and melt. Part of his cheek was stuck to the collar of his shirt, staining it with yellowed fat. Yes. He wheezed, the swamp pouring from his nostrils. Help. Marnie shrunk backwards, clawing at her scalp and face. Dead man. She shrieked, thumping her boots together. Dead man. No, Mercury said, wanting to both shield her eyes and bat her to death all at once. It's just a recluse bite. Brown recluse spiders. They weren't even new. When Mercury had been young and called something else, their mother had been bitten by one. She had forgotten to shake out the bed linen linens that night, and it had nipped her right elbow. She'd had the blister treated by a local pharmacist. It hadn't even scarred. Except pharmacists were a folk tale now. 
treatment did not and would not ever exist in the swamp cult. Please, said the man again. You must help me. Mercury cocked their gun but didn't aim. Not yet. What's your name? They said. Lionel. He breathed and collapsed forward onto the counter. Lionel Romero. All right, Lionel. Mercury put their other hand on the P-92 and brought it up between his eyes. I'm going to shoot you now. Okay, he said. I wish you were a patriot. They whispered, fingering the trigger. But you're not, are you? No, he answered. I'm not. I'm sorry, they said and took the shot. When they turned back to Marnie, she had her hands over her mouth and her skirt up about her waist, exposing the pale underbelly of her thighs. Mercury decided they did not have the patience for her delicate sensibilities. Get up, they ordered, wiping a strip of sweat from their upper lip. Grabbed you a pack of Salem's while you're at it. Damn! This world is so harsh! Oh no! Marnie's, Marnie's lost her wits. She was not you. Mercury is ruthless as a stash of gum because it's the only joy it brings men. Yeah, everyone only has a little bit of joy in this world. For for Jew, it's Salem's. For Nin, it's green apple gum. We have yet to discover what Mercury and Marnie's. Well, Marnie's is knitting, but I adore Mercury. I think they're wonderful. I think Mercury Mercury's great. I've I've kind of like mm. I was supposed to be doing it so that other people were like centering, but every time I've gone to write a piece, Mercury has just slipped into like <laughs> the protagonist spot, which I don't hate it at all. I really like that Mercury's become this sort of central character, but I feel like I'm kind of not giving Nin and Junimo <laughs> enough screen time at the moment. Um, so I need to work on that, but I'm sorry if my voices for them keep changing per episode. <laughs> yeah, no, happens. they were great. They were brilliant. I just love I what you've them. done with Marnie's character of just how you've just sort of upped the um the random things that Marnie does. Like I really love the line they don't uh, that she doesn't believe in shoes. I just mm. Well, like when she was nail to, yeah, the original yeah. when she didn't wear any shoes. Yeah, I yeah. like how you <laughs> dial up and dial down those characteristics in her, depending on what um, sort of it's genre true. you're writing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just, I just I... want to give her a hug. Okay, maybe, maybe not a hug. She's, she's a bit weird. I'll give her a cup to of kill tea. you. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't her want her to kill tea. me. Yeah. And and may, and maybe like a little hand on the shoulder like yeah. it's gonna be okay <laughs> elbow bump <laughs> can we also I'll, get a compilation can we get a compilation of your the reason i put them in is because i know what they look like on the audio so i'll just like jump <laughs> to those bits and just <laughs> cut them out <laughs> so i go Cover. to just cover it up <laughs> got a system in place so just want to do a quick little shout out to Carrie who sent us a really lovely um, voice message the other day through Anchor, like the voice messaging system. I'd even forgotten that there was a voice messaging system. And yeah, she just said some really lovely things about our show. And yeah, so thanks so much for sending that, Carrie. And also congratulations on winning your competition. You're amazing, Carrie. Your message got passed around the. Your message got passed around the group chat in record time. It did. I was so happy. It made me so happy because I was in the middle of editing as well. So I was like halfway through my eight-hour editing shift, and so to just have a lovely message from Carrie just made it so much easier. I just felt so good. (laughs) Also, please send in writing, Carrie, if you if you want it sent in. Yes. We we love having extra guest pieces. Yeah, definitely. Like dragons hoarding writing rather than gold. <laughs> <laughs> we With just like magpies writing. But yeah. My, my nick my nickname with my D and D group is Quote Dragon because I collect <laughs> quotes and then give people like their quotes back from the session. So That's anyway. <laughs> um, right, Bella, you need to. Go off and 
fight dragons, would you like to do the outro? I do need to go off and fight dragons. So here it is. Thank you so much to all the writers on today's show, and thank you so much to all of you beautiful people for listening. To support us, please subscribe to our Patreon at www.patreon.com slash promptedwritingpodcast. We do bonus content on there, and we do shoutouts. Our YouTube is also now up for this series, and that is also Prompted Writing Podcast. Be sure to leave us a review telling us what you think. For more prompts and writing, find us on Instagram at, you guessed it, Prompted Writing Podcast. Thanks so much again for listening, and I guess I'll hit that outro. 